Today we're going to begin talking about power and three phase circuits, and we are going to start with instantaneous power. That's not how you spell balanced. So let's say that we have, just for the sake of argument, a Y connected load. Since we're going to be dealing with instantaneous power, I'm going to define a voltage drop across each phase of my load, VAN of T, VBN of T, and VCN, sorry, of T. And I'm going to have phase currents as well that will be uh, I A N T I B N of T and I C N of T. So let's say that VA N of T looks like VM cosine omega T plus some phase angle theta V plus zero degrees. VBN of T would look like VM cosine omega T plus theta V minus 120 degrees. And VCN of T would look like VM cosine omega T let's say to be and it's 240 degrees. I'm also going to have three currents. This will be I am cosine omega t plus theta i plus zero degrees. I am cos omega t plus theta i minus 120 degrees. A moment to make myself slightly more comfortable. I cn of t is equal I am cosine omega t plus theta i minus 240 degrees like so. so. 
have a balanced three phase load, we should observe the B phase lags the A phase by negative 100 or by 120 degrees, the C phase lags the B phase by 120 degrees. And we are taking into account that the phase angle of our voltage and the phase angle of our current are likely going to be different things. So instantaneous power absorbed by my three phase load is going to be, the, sorry, these should be capitals. The power absorbed by my A phase plus the power absorbed by my B phase plus power absorbed by my C phase. And if we get math involved here, what we'll find is that we'll have one half BM IM cosine theta V minus theta I plus one half BM IM cosine twice omega t plus theta v plus theta i. So that's v a n times i a n. Now we'll do the b phase. We're going to have one half v m i m sine theta v minus theta i plus one half VM IM cosine twice omega T plus theta V plus theta I minus 240 degrees. And then one half VM IM cosine theta V minus theta i plus one half vm i am cosine twice omega t plus theta v plus theta i minus 480 degrees so that we have three equal dc contributions and then three high frequency because it's oscillating at twice omega AC contributions. Now, because all of our AC contributions are oscillating at the same frequency, we can actually add them all together as a single sinusoidal function, right? So we have one that has a phase angle of zero degrees, another that has a phase angle of negative 240 degrees, and then another AC contribution that has a phase angle of negative 480. So uh, what I would like you guys to do is to add one angle zero plus one angle negative 240 plus one angle negative 480 and see what happens. It's zero. It's zero. Absolutely correct. So when we add this term, this term, and this term together, they wind up completely canceling each other out. And we are left with three halves VM IM cosine theta V minus theta I. And we could just as easily express this as three times the magnitude of VAN times the magnitude of IAN cosine theta V minus theta I. 
probably go back around to our RMS values by simply observing that the magnitude of VAN is VM over the square root of two, and the magnitude of IAN is IM over the square root of two. Now, there's something pretty interesting going on here because we have developed an equation for the instantaneous power absorbed by our load, which means we should have some time dependence, but we find that there is no time dependence in our final expression, meaning that the instantaneous power absorbed by a balanced three-phase load is constant. So what is the average power absorbed by a balanced three-phase load then? Exactly this, no change whatsoever. This is one of the biggest reasons why three-phase loads are used in industrial settings. If the power delivered by a three-phase load is constant and we're hooking it up to something like an induction motor, if the power is constant, then the torque that the motor experiences is constant, which means it operates at a minimum possible level of vibrations, meaning that we get the least amount of potential opportunities for mechanical deformation due to vibration. There is a very, very specific reason why the three phase electric machines that we have in our power labs, some of which predate World War II, are still in operation. They experience very little opportunities to be damaged if they're connected to a three phase system. So, this is our instantaneous power relationship. Yes, ma'am. Three phase. So, three angle fee, uh, fee, and then, you know, as a function of time. Bradley. And overseas, they use different methods to deliver power. You can still have the same effect. Mm -hmm. As long as it's a three phases. So overseas, it's just oscillating at a different frequency. Okay. So it's still three phase. Yeah, it's still three phase. Yes. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me see what's going on in the chat here. What happened to the three halves in the last step? All right, so I'll explain both of those things here. All right, so all of those one halves came from this trig identity that says cosine angle one times cosine angle two is equal to one half cosine angle one minus angle two plus one half cosine angle one plus angle two. We've used that before. So that's where all the one halves come from. And that's why we wind up getting GC terms when things cancel out and twice frequency terms when they add together. So that's where all of these three bits came from. The left-hand side came from this part. Uh, the difference of the angles, the right hand side came from this part where it's some of the angles. So Taj's question asking, well, where the hell did the three halves go? If we recognize that the magnitude of VAN is VM over the square root of two and magnitude of IAN is IM over the square root of two. We can take that factor of one half out and wind up getting this in terms of our effective values. All right, so this three halves VM IM bit right here could be written as three VM over root two times IM over root two. And then we can treat VM over root two as the magnitude of VAN and IM over root two as the magnitude of IAN. Is that a sufficient explanation, Taj?
All right. So now, yes. Do you get these same kind of relationships? What do you mean on smaller scales? Like microprocessors and stuff? Microprocessors typically use DC power, so I don't. Okay. Yeah. Most computer applications um, typically all of the transistor circuitry inside of them utilizes DC power. Um, so not that about exactly right. No, I mean, you're going to have oscillations in as much as you're going to have clock frequencies and all that kind of stuff, but it's going to be, I hesitate to call it, a, I mean, it's definitely a digital signal, but I would call it more so a binary signal of you're going to have offs and ons at specific voltages and all that kind of good stuff. That's not going to be smooth sinusoids and all that jazz. All right. So now let's talk about complex power in balanced three phase. Again, we're going to look at a Y connected network. A, B, and C. We're going to assume that we have some transmission line impedance on each of our three phases. And here's our Y connected load. So if my Y connected load use the following voltage drops. And following currents. Sorry, that one should be a B. complex power absorbed in my three phase system, S three phase, give me the complex power absorbed by my A phase of the load, plus the complex power absorbed by the B phase of the load, plus the complex power absorbed by C phase of the load. Well, for the A phase of the load, this is simply VAN times IAN conjugate. Or the magnitude of VAN times the magnitude of IAN 
with an angle of theta van minus theta ian, which we could then call the magnitude of van times the magnitude of ian with an angle of theta zy. Right. I'm saying here, theta zy is the exact same thing as angle theta van minus theta ian, because that is literally the definition of the angle of the impedance from the definition of impedance. If we looked at phase B, this would look like VBN times IBN conjugate, which is then the magnitude of VBN times the magnitude of IBN angle theta VBN minus theta IAN or the magnitude of VBN times the magnitude of IBN with an angle to see what. What's the relationship between the magnitude of VBN to the magnitude of VAN for a balanced three phase network? They're the same. What about the magnitude of current IBN to the magnitude of current IAN? What's their relationship? They're also identical, which means the complex power absorbed by phase B is literally identical to the complex power absorbed by phase A. Obviously, the same thing will happen for phase C. So that we can say in general, The three phase power is three times the complex power absorbed by just the A phase of the Y connected impedance. And I'm gonna write this as three VP IP angle Theta Z. So let me explain what VP and IP represent here. VP represents the magnitude of the phase voltage. IP represents the magnitude of the phase current. And theta Z represents the angle of the impedance. Okay. So we only need to know magnitudes and the angle of the impedance, and we can calculate the complex path. Now, let's say that instead we didn't have a phase voltage. What if we knew the line voltage? How could we correct this equation to account for line voltages? So what's the relationship between a phase voltage and a line voltage in a Y-connected system? Right. So 3VP is going to look like 
square root of three times the square root of three VP IP angle theta Z, which is the same as square root of three VL. A second here. IP angle theta Z. Now let's look at something a little, what, uh, what was that Bradley? Sorry, is the VL line voltage? Yeah, VL is a line voltage here. The magnitude of the line voltage. So let's look at something real quick. Here. For this Y connected load, where we have line currents, like this, IAA, what's the relationship between our line current and our phase current? They're the same thing. So we can then finally call this the square root of three VL IL angle theta Z. I'm gonna put some boxes around things here. So now we have the complex power only in terms of phase quantities. Here we have the complex power only in terms of line quantities. While we derive this specifically for a Y connected load, it's actually applicable for delta connected loads as well. All right? Let's talk about why that is. For a delta connected load, the line voltage and the phase voltage are the same quantities, but we'll see that there is a square root of three based relationship between the line currents and the phase currents for a delta connected load. We can prove that rather easily. So if we had a delta connected load, Here's A, B, C. So here's our phase current. Let's call this IAB another phase current IBC and our third phase current ICA. Our line current IAA flowing in like this. Well, if we apply Kirchhoff's current law, we'll find that IAA is equal to IAB minus ICA or IAB one minus one angle negative 240 degrees. Somebody tell me what that one minus one angle negative 240 is. If I'm not mistaken, it's square root of three angle negative 30 degrees. But you guys have calculators. Tell me what's up. Square root of three angle negative 30 degrees which means IL is simply IP times the square root of three for a delta connected load. So scrolling back up here, while this was derived entirely for a Y connected system, it works for either.
So we only need to know phase voltage and phase current or line voltage and line current magnitudes and the angle of our impedance. And when they, we can then calculate our three phase complex power, all right? So that's our complex power relationships. I'll rewrite them up here. S three phase equal to three VP IP angle theta Z, which is the same as square root of three VL IL angle theta z. Our average power p three phase, what's that going to be? So average power is going to be the real part, right? Apparent power is going to be the magnitude. So the real part of this guy is going to look like three VP IP cosine theta Z, which by the way is literally exactly what we got for the instantaneous power or root three VL IL cosine theta Z. Our reactive power is the imaginary part. So that's going to be three VP IP sine theta Z or root three VL IL sine theta Z. Our apparent power. Is just going to be three VP IP or root three VL IL, and our power factor is still defined. Sorry, that should be a P, not a B, as the ratio of our average power to parent power, which will simply be the cosine of theta z. All right. So one thing that I want to point out here is that you don't actually have to learn any of these relationships. And so what I mean by that specifically is that if you can figure out how to calculate the complex power for a single phase, you can just multiply by three to get the complex power absorbed by all three phases, right? All of these relationships are the exact same thing as we saw when we were looking at our steady state sinusoidal power analysis relationships, except they're three times as large because there are three phases. It is literally nothing different whatsoever. I've had students tell me before that they struggle figuring out how to use or apply these relationships. I don't particularly understand that, but if that is the case, literally throw all this shit away, figure out what's going on with a single phase, Multiply it by three, you're going to get the same answer. Bradley, you raise your hand. All of this is for any connection we have whatsoever. As long as we can figure out whatever the phase voltage is and the phase current for the left hand side of equations or the line voltage and the line current for the right hand side of equations, it does not matter what the configuration is. 
These are applicable for any and every three phase system, as is simply figuring out what the quantity is on a per phase basis and then multiplying that number by three. All right, so. Three phase power factor correction. It's not as bad as you would think. All right. So in three phase power factor correction, we have two options instead of a single option, okay? So let's say that we have a balanced three-phase source. Having terminals A, B, and C. This source could be delta connected, it could be Y connected, it is immaterial. Let's say on this side, we have a balanced three phase load. We have our transmission lines, which I'm just going to represent right here as wires for a moment. Okay. Our three phase load might be delta, it might be Y. We don't know, nor do we care. Okay. And I'm just going to duplicate this little drawing here real quick so that we can talk about the two different ways that we can do this. All right. So option one is we Y connect the capacitor back, right? So We might have three instances of CY tied together at some common neutral. That neutral point between those Y connected capacitor bank does not have to be connected to the source or the load. So it is a Y connected capacitor bank is fair game for any type of configuration we might have. Our other option, hopefully fairly obvious, would be a delta connected bank. Where all of these have some value C delta. Now we're going to talk our way through 
the mathematical relationships that are associated. Okay. So one thing I want to make very, very obvious is we aren't able to correct our power factor using a single capacitance, right? We have to use a three phase capacitor bank in order to do power factor correction on a three phase system. So why I'm being very specific and deliberate about this is because if we simply took let's call it S three phase old minus S three phase new to figure out how many bars our capacitor bank needed to provide, we need to do that with the understanding that we're figuring out how many bars the three capacitors are providing and then divide that number by a factor of three to figure out how much each individual capacitor is supplying to the system, right? So there's a very, uh, I'm saying all of this to say that there's a very simple mistake that I see students make over and over and over again, where effectively they solve for what single capacitor would fix everything instead of which single capacitor in a three phase bank would fix everything. Okay. So, Recall from our single phase power factor correction relationships that the size of the capacitor is given by P old times the tangent of theta old minus the tangent of theta nu divided by omega multiplied by the magnitude of the RMS voltage drop across the capacitor squared. There are a couple of things here that we need to be very specific about in order to use this equation in a three-phase system. The first of which is that this P old should be representative of only one phase of the system. So I'm just gonna call this P old per phase. The other thing that we need to be careful about is that the voltage drop across the capacitor in a Y connected system is a voltage measured from a line to a neutral. For a delta connected capacitor, it's a voltage measured from a line to a line. So we need to be very careful about what voltage we put in for our VC, depending on what configuration we're wanting versus what configuration we are told, okay? So that's a potential hiccup place, figuring out what P old is because we need to specifically do it per phase. Determining VC is another potential place or potential opportunity for mistakes uh, because we need to make sure that if we're looking for a Y connected capacitor bank, we're taking the voltage drop from the transmission line connection to the neutral connection. And for a delta connected capacitor bank, we're looking for a effectively line to line voltage. So, Let's say that we have a 
a balanced three phase source. feeds a balanced three phase load, which draws a total of 24 megavolt amperes. operating at a power factor equal to 0 0.78 lagging. If the line voltages the source are EL is equal to 34.5 kilovolts RMS at an operating frequency of F is equal to 60 hertz. Determine what size capacitor bank is needed to improve power factor to zero point nine four. All right, so I'm going to rewrite my equation for C here. P old per phase multiplied by the tangent of theta old minus the tangent of theta nu. divided by omega times the RMS voltage drop across the capacitor squared. We're just gonna talk our way through figuring out what all of the different parameters of this equation are, okay? And how to calculate them. So let's start with probably the, the lowest hanging fruit. Yes. So it's Old slash phase? Yeah, per phase. Per phase, thank you. So let's start with the easiest quantity, in my opinion, um, omega. How do we figure out what omega is based on the information that we were provided? Two pi times f. Absolutely right. So since this is a 60 hertz system, that's going to be 120 pi radians per second. All right, one down. Theta old, in my opinion, is pretty easy to determine. How do we do that? Inverse cosine of power factor old, absolutely correct. get my calculator out.
Yes. Um, two to three, like you, it doesn't have to be ultra precise because you're never going to be able to get like a 47.194 nanofarad capacitor or anything like that. You're just, yeah, like you're not going to try to really improve it to 0.94. You're going to be trying to improve it to 0.94 or better as cheaply as possible. Um, so the precision there doesn't particularly matter. Is it doing what it needs to do? If the answer is yes, and you did it as cheaply as possible, you did it right. Yes. All right, theta nu is pretty easy to determine as well. Because that's gonna be simply the inverse cosine of the new power factor or the inverse cosine of 0 0.94. Oh, is it leading? Yes, you're correct. So this one here should be negative because if we want a leading power factor, um, that means the angle should be negative. Um, yeah, so 0 0.94, negative 19.948, degrees. All right. Um, so how are we going to figure out P old? No. What are the units of megavolt amperes? What are they representative of? apparent power. So we're told how much apparent power we have. And from that, we need to figure out what our average power is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, what Logan Got it, yes, nailed it. Only one day before the end of the quarter. What Logan suggested, sorry, um, is that we could say S old is the apparent power that we're given with an angle of theta old and express this in rectangular coordinates. He is not wrong. Uh, so let's say this is going to be 24 angle 38.739 degrees mega volt amperes. And now I'm going to convert this to rectangular form. And I get 18.720 plus J 15.019 megavolt amperes. Okay. So from this, dang it, P three phase is 18.720 megawatts. Uh, yes. <clears throat> the inverse cosine function is incapable of returning a negative angle. That's why we have to put the negative sign in front of the inverse cosine function. The inverse cosine function will always give us a positive angle. We force it to be negative by putting the negative sign here. 
The reason why we need the negative sign is because we know that our power factor is meant to be leaving. Okay. All right, so we have the three phase average power, which isn't actually what we want. How do we get the power per phase? Divide it by three. Yeah, not particularly difficult. So 18.720 over three. The old per phase is six point two four megawatts. All right, and then the last thing we need is the voltage drop across our capacitor, which means we need to decide whether we're going to be dealing with a Y connected bank or a delta connected bank. Well, let's do both, all right? Let's start with a Y connected bank. C, Y, okay? So that's gonna be 6.24 megawatts times the tangent of theta old, 38.739 degrees minus the tangent of theta nu, negative 19.948 degrees. All divided by omega 120 pi radians per second, and then we want a line to neutral voltage. So we have a voltage of 34.5 kilovolts RMS, and that was a line volt. So it's measured from line to line. So how do we get that from a line to line voltage to a line to neutral coil? So we only want the magnitudes, but you're right. We divide by a factor of the square root of three. What we should find here is that we get 48.612 microfarads. For a delta connected bank, what's the only difference that we're going to have? This voltage is no longer going to be divided by a square root of three and a quantity squared. So effectively, it's going to be this thing divided by a factor of three. Right? Because I have the square root of three quantity squared, so a factor of three in the denominator of my denominator, which is the same as having it in the numerator. So we should see that CY is always three times larger than C delta. Which would come out to be 16.204. Each capacitor in the bank will have that value. The reason why I can say that definitively is because we're using the power per phase. So this is what we need to do per phase. So, let me ask you guys a question, uh, which is usually actually asked of me. 
Um, why would you ever do a Y connected bank? Yes. So for the Delta connected bank, we're not going to, this isn't going to show up here because we're already given a line to line voltage. Oh, okay. Right. And for a Delta connected bank, so for the Delta connected bank, we're already given a line to line voltage and that line to line voltage is the voltage that will appear across the capacitor. Okay. So we don't have to fix it to make it look like it's a line to neutral voltage. So we wouldn't have done anything with the Y connected bank, but we would multiply when we did the delta, we would multiply the voltage by square root to bring it to a line and it would have the exact same quantity, right? Uh, so uh, the exact same quality, in as much as we would see that the delta connection is three times smaller than the Y connection. Um, all right, circling back around. Why would we ever use a Y connected capacitor bank? Let me explain really what I'm asking. The Delta connected capacitor bank is going to utilize smaller capacitors. Physically smaller capacitors will probably be cheaper. But the physically smaller capacitors have to be rated to handle a larger voltage, right? They would have to be able to handle at least 34.5 kilovolts RMS, whereas these larger capacitors would only have to do whatever 34.5 over the square root of three is, right? So there's a trade-off there. It's a physically larger capacitor, but it doesn't have to be rated to accommodate as high of a voltage drop. Right, so you're still going to probably have to explore which one is the cheaper option um, in order to figure out which one that you would actually do. You can't just arbitrarily say, oh, we'll just do everything in delta because it's going to be a smaller capacitor value. It's true that smaller capacitor value having to withstand square root of three times as much voltage, though, it might be cheaper the other way around. All right, so that is enough out of me for today. Uh, and that is the last topic that I wanted to cover in this class.